It's Wiz for Spinner, and I haven't made a video in a very long time. I had a very lazy day today because I had the day off work. I had some errands to run that I can't do at the weekend. So, what happened is I took the day off work and got everything done that I needed to get done. And then this afternoon I took a nap and I woke up and I thought, wow, my voice sounds a little husky. And that is the perfect time to record an ASMR video. So, I thought I would read some of a book for you. Now, I know this book is not going to be to everyone's tastes. So, it's, I want to read an English translation of a Norwegian book that's very popular um, in Scandinavia. And I think in Poland there's a wide readership. It's by a woman called Margit Sandemo. And I want to read from the first book in this very epic series called Legend of the Ice People, Sagan om Isfolket. So, this book was translated by Gregory Herring and Angela Cook, and it was first published in Norwegian in 1982, and it is a kind of cheesy historical romance fantasy very loose, <laughs> very loose real history. Um, so what I'll do is I'll read the back description and if you want to hear some of this book, you can stay tuned. If you think that you don't want to hear what's in this book, you can listen to another video. So here we go. In the freezing Norwegian winter of 1581, the plague robbed 16-year-old Celia Angrimsdotter of all her family. Homeless, starving, and shepherding two newly orphaned infants, she heads in desperation for the warmth of the funeral pyres blazing beyond the city gates of corpse-littered Trondheim. But in the shadowy forest, one of the infamous ice people, a strangely captivating wolfman, comes to her aid. The whole saga, which opens with Spellbound, spans four centuries and interweaves historical European events, romance and fantasy in engrossing narratives that are always passionate, earthy, mystical, often erotic, and imbued above all else with a powerful narrative drive. Now, um, this, <laughs> it's not, they're not that saucy, but... Um, they are written in the 80s, which means they're of their time. This is not like a contemporary uh, paranormal romance. There's no, this isn't like about a witch who owns a cupcake store and everything's cute and nice. Um, but here we go. Now, I apologize. I think my chair... Is quite creaky, but I'll do my best. Right, so this is English translation of, uh, I think, the first chapter of Spellbound by Margit Sandemo, book one of Legend of the Ice People. Chapter one. One evening in the late autumn of 1581, as an icy mist played with the blood-red reflection of fire in the sky above Trondheim, Two young women made their way along the town street, each unaware of the other. Celia, barely seventeen, was a girl whose large eyes held a look of indifference to the world around her, hollow as they were with the loneliness and hunger she felt inside. She hugged herself to keep out the cold, thrusting her hands deep beneath her clothes, most of which seemed to be made from old sacks sewn together. She had bound strips of hide around her pathetically worn shoes and covered her beautiful hazelnut hair with a woolen shawl 
the same one she would use to wrap around herself whenever she found a safe place to sleep. She stepped around a corpse lying in the narrow alley, just one more victim of the plague, she told herself. This plague. She could no longer remember how many outbreaks there had been during the last century. Had taken her whole family just two or three weeks ago, leaving her on her own and forced to search for food. Her father had been a blacksmith on a large farm to the south of Trondheim, but when he and her mother, brother, and sister had died, Celia had been driven out of the little cabin where they lived. What use would a young girl be in a blacksmith's forge? In truth, Celia had been relieved to leave the farm. She had left behind a secret buried deep in her heart that she had never shared with anyone else. To the southwest lay the strange, eerie mountains she called the Land of Shadows or the Land of Evening. Throughout her childhood, their brooding mass had both frightened her and held her spellbound. They were so far away as to be barely visible, but when the brightness of the evening sun lit up their jagged peaks, it gave them a strange, ethereal clarity that stirred the girl's lively imagination. She would gaze at the mountains for ages, in fear and fascination. Then finally she would see them, the nameless creatures that lived there. They rose up from the valleys between the peaks, gliding slowly through the air, searching closer and closer to her home until their evil eyes found her. Whenever this happened, Celia would run and hide. Except they did have a name. People on the farm always spoke of the distant mountains in hushed voices, and it was probably their words that had first frightened her and excited her imagination. You must never go up there, they would say. There is nothing but witchcraft and evil there. The ice people are not human. They are the spawn of cold and darkness, and woe betide the person who goes too close to their lair. The ice people, yes, that was what they were called. But Celia was the only person who'd seen them riding on the air. She had never known what to call these creatures. Not trolls, oh no, they were not trolls. Nor were they wraiths. They could not be called devils either. Were they some sort of supernatural marvel, perhaps, or spirits from beyond the grave? She had once heard their landlord call one of the horses a demon. This was a new word to her ears, but she felt it was a suitable name for them. The strength of her fantasies about the land of shadows was such that she would often dream about it while in a restless and troubled sleep. It was only natural that she should turn her back to those haunting mountains as she left the farm. A primitive instinct had led her to Trondheim, where she would find people, hoping for help now that she was alone and in need. She soon came to realize that none of the townspeople welcomed strangers into their homes, especially now, at a time when the plague followed in the footsteps of those who traveled the land. What better place for the sickness to spread unchecked than in these overcrowded houses, fighting for space in dirty, narrow streets? It had taken her a whole day to find a way to get past the town gates. When she had noticed some families returning from work to their homes in the town, she followed them, and walking on the far side of one of their wagons, slipped unnoticed past the guards. Once inside, however, she had not found help. Nothing, that is, but a few stale crusts of bread thrown to her now and then from a window, and barely enough to keep her from the grave. From the marketplace by the cathedral could be heard the sounds of drunkenness and brawling. Once, foolishly, she had gone there, drawn by the promise of the company of others like herself. It hadn't taken her long to see that there was no, this was no place for a pretty young girl. Seeing the mom had been a shock, and although she tried to put it out of her mind, she couldn't quite forget the experience. After several days of walking, her feet ached constantly. The long, long road to Trondheim had exhausted her of all energy, and with no comfort to be found there, she felt the consuming pain of hopelessness clawing at her insides. She heard rats squeal from the doorway she had begun to walk towards, hoping to find a place to sleep for a few hours so she turned away and continued on her hopeless journey. Without thinking, 
she was being drawn towards the glow of the fires across the hill outside of town. Fire meant warmth. It also meant burning corpses. For three days and three nights, a huge funeral prior had been alight. Just beside it stood the scaffold. She hurriedly mumbled a prayer. Lord Jesus, keep me from the evil of these lost souls. Give me courage and strength so that with thy grace I can rest there safely for a while. I desperately need warmth, lest I should perish. The dread filled, filling her innocent heart and her gaze fixed on the rising haze of warmth. Celia stumbled on towards the western gate. In the meantime, the young aristocrat, Charlotte Medean, had taken to the street on a far more secret errand of her own. In horror she walked in her silken shoes, sinking into that indescribable filth underfoot. Ice had blocked the gutter that ran down the middle of the street, causing the disgusting mess to remain where it lay. She cradled a tightly wrapped bundle in her arms. She had stealthily slipped away from her father's large and imposing residence and was now making her way towards the town gates, quietly humming to herself a slow dance tune, a pavane, to keep her from thinking about what was wrapped in the bundle. Her progress was painfully slow. Her lips were white, and beads of sweat shone on her forehead and upper lip. Her hair clung to her temples. That she had been able to keep her condition hidden for all these loathsome, anxious months was still a mystery to her. However, she had always been small and slender, and nothing had really shown. The style of dress worn at the time had helped, with corsets and flowing crinolines, and a surcoat that draped from her shoulders, covering everything. Furthermore, she had dressed herself, always pulling her corset painfully tight. No one, least of all her chambermaid, had suspected anything. How intensely she had hated the life that grew within her. It was the result of a casual affair with an incredibly handsome Dane from the court of King Frederick. Only later had she learned that he was married. One evening of blind passion, and this torment had been her punishment. He, of course, went merrily on his way to find new conquests. She had tried every means to rid herself of this intrusion in her life, strong potions, jumping from the balustrades of, and uh, hot baths. Why, she had even visited the churchyard one Thursday night last summer, and there she had performed rites so secret and hideous that she had banished them from her memory. It was no use. The spiteful being inside of her body had clung to life with the persistence of a devil. Oh, how afraid she had been these last months. She still was. Strangely, however, at that moment, she didn't feel that same burning hatred towards the unwanted creature. Instead, she began to feel something else stir her heart. A warm glow, great sorrow, and a longing. No, she could not allow herself to think such thoughts. Just walk, walk quickly, and avoid these few people who are out on a night such as this. It was so cold, poor thing. Oh, no. She caught a glimpse of a young girl, scarcely more than a child, coming down a side street and slipped quickly into a doorway. The girl, Celia, passed her without noticing her. She looks so alone. Charlotte thought, with a sudden pang of heartfelt compassion that she could not allow herself to feel. She must not allow herself any feelings of sympathy. She must not be weak. Above all, she must hurry. She must be back inside town before the gatekeeper closed the gates at nine o'clock. The gatekeeper did not frighten her, and if he should ask, she could account for herself. The cloak she had thrown around her shoulders belonged to one of the servants. No one would recognize the elegant mistress Charlotte Midian dressed like this. At last, she reached the gates, and as expected, the gatekeeper stopped her. She held out the bundle for a moment. Just one more dead. I'm going out to, she muttered. The man waved her through without a second glance. She saw the forest in front of her now, the jagged tops of the pines in silhouette against the glow from the fire. Bright moonlight shone over the frozen evening landscape, making it easy to find the way. If only she hadn't been so exhausted. She was in pain now, more afraid, and from time to time she felt a warm stickiness soak into the towel she had used to try to stop the bleeding. The child had been born in the hayloft above the stables. She had bitten hard on a piece of wood to stop herself crying out. 
Afterwards, exhausted from her ordeal, she had lain for a long, long time, before without looking at it, she had bundled the baby up and risen unsteadily to her feet. She hadn't touched the umbilical cord. In her mind, it seemed, she could have nothing to do with this child. She had smothered its weak, pitiful cries with the blanket. It was still alive, and she felt it move now and then. Thank goodness it hadn't cried out as she passed the gates. She was certain she had removed all trace of the event from the hayloft. If only she could be rid of this shameful burden and return home unnoticed, then she would be free. Finally, free at last. She had come far enough into the woods. Over there, she thought, beneath the tall pine tree, a long way from the path. Charlotte Midian's hands shook as she laid the bundle down on the bare, frozen ground. Her chest tightened, and tears welled up as she tucked a woolen blanket and shawl around the small spark of life, and placed a small pot of milk she had brought with her beside the baby's cheek. Deep down, of course, she knew it could never drink the milk, but she could not bring herself to admit it. She stood unmoving for a moment, while an unexpected, overwhelming feeling of loss and despair raced within her until finally she staggered off, her frozen steps taking her back toward the town. Inside its walls, Celia kept on walking, grateful for the moonlight that cast its pale aura onto the streets and alleyways, making it easy for her to avoid the bay windows and other strange features on the buildings as she passed. Step by step, one foot followed the other, half asleep. She kept going, if she allowed herself to think, she would feel the cold, the hunger, the utter weariness, and the certain certainty that she had nowhere to go and no future. Someone was sobbing nearby. She stopped. She was at the entrance of a narrow alleyway, making her way towards the western gates. It was very dark in the alley. The moonlight did not reach beyond the entrance. The crying came from a yard at the back where, the, where a door stood half open. It was the sound of a child. Its heart-rending sobs tore at her. Hesitantly, Celia drew closer and stepped inside. It was not so dark in the yard. The moonlight lit up the small open space, which was surrounded by low houses. A little girl, about two years old, was kneeling beside a dead woman. The child was pulling and shaking her mother, trying to wake her up. Although Celia was little more than a child herself, her young heart was touched by the plight of the child, but the sight of the woman's corpse held her back. The tortured face, the froth around her mouth, were clear signs that the plague had struck again. Trundelog, as this part of the country was called, had been overwhelmed by this pestilence, which in reality consisted of two different illnesses. Plague was the common name for all sicknesses, and this one had come from Denmark. Sometimes known as the Spanish wheeze, it was a catarrh that caused fever, headaches, and pains in the chest. At the same time, another type of plague had come from Sweden, this one causing boils and open sores, pains in the side, and headaches that eventually led to madness. Celia knew the symptoms. She had seen them all too often. And yet, the child had not seen her. Celia was so exhausted that she could not think quickly, but she knew that she alone among her family had survived. She had been wandering through town amongst its dead and dying for a long time now without being infected. Celia did not fear for herself. But what of the little girl? She had little chance of escaping the sickness, and were she to stay here alone with her dead mother, she would have no chance at all. Celia went and knelt beside the child, who turned her tearful face towards the girl. She was a beautiful little girl, stocky, with dark curly hair, dark eyes, and small, strong hands. Your mother is dead, Celia said softly. She can't talk to you anymore. You'll have to come with me. The girl's lips trembled, but surprise had stopped her tears. Celia rose to her feet and pushed in turn at each of the doors that opened onto the yard. All three were locked. The dead woman probably hadn't lived here. She had seemingly just decided this dark alley was a fitting place to die. Celia knew from experience that it was pointless to knock. People would not open their doors. With a few swift movements, she tore a strip of cloth from the hem of her tattered skirt and knotted it into a rag doll. She placed it in the dead woman's hands to stop her returning from beyond the grave to look for her daughter. Then she said a silent prayer to the poor woman's soul. 
Come along, she said to the little girl. We must leave. The child did not want to go. She clung to her mother's cape. It was pretty and didn't seem too warm. The girl was also well-dressed. Nothing extravagant, but simple and well-made. The girl's mother had been a real beauty once, but now her black, unseeing eyes stared at the moon. It never would have crossed Celia's mind to take the dead woman's cape to protect her own frozen body from the cold. The thought of stealing from a corpse repelled her, especially one who had fallen victim to the plague. Come, she said again, feeling helpless as she faced the child's tired, small sobs. Gently, she opened the child's hands and took her in her arms. We must try to find you some food. She had, of course, no idea where to find any, but the word food worked its magic on the child who resigned herself and, letting out a final tearful, shaking sigh, allowed herself to be carried out of the yard. She cast a last agonizing look back at her mother that was full of grief and heartache. Celia would never forget that look. The child wept silently as Celia carried her through the streets, the last stretch towards the gates. She had obviously been crying for so long that she was now too tired to want to resist. But Celia had another worry. Suddenly, she was responsible for another human being, a child that would probably be dead from the plague in a few days. But until that happened, Celia had to make sure she didn't go hungry. They were closer to the town gate now, and between the houses she caught occasional glimpse, glimpses of the glow from the funeral pyres. It had been bitterly cold of late, making the frozen ground too hard for graves to be dug, so the dead were consigned to the flames. There was a large mass grave that she, but no, she could not allow herself to contemplate such anguish now. She saw a, young, she saw a woman leaning against the wall of a building and looking as if she would faint at any moment. Hesitantly, Celia approached her. Can I help you? she asked timidly. The woman turned and looked at her with tired eyes. She seemed to be a lady of noble bearing, but her features were deathly white and beads of perspiration were running down her face. As Charlotte Medean's eyes focused on Celia, she forced herself upright and started to walk away. Nobody can help me, she mumbled as she disappeared down a side street. Celia watched her go but did not follow. The plague again, she told herself. There's nothing I can do. Finally, they reached the gates. Although they would remain open for a while, Celia knew they did not want to return to town again. There was no relief to be found there, not for her or the child. Of that, she was certain. She would have to try and find shelter in a barn in the countryside, or something. What if we should meet a wild animal, she wondered. Not that wild animals could be any worse than the brutes to be found around the marketplace in town. Those drunken and debauched wretches who pestered her whenever she came near their territory. They showed complete indifference to the plague, perhaps because they knew that it's, that they soon would be beyond help and were trying to experience all the pleasures of this life before leaving it. The guard at the gate asked where she was going so late in the evening, but he was less interested in those leaving than in those who were coming in. She told him that they had been turned out because they showed sign of sickness. He understood at once, and with a wave of his hand sent them on their way. He would not worry that they might carry the sickness to others. Oh no, not at all, just as long as it left his town. The warm glow of the fire urged her on. Celia walked faster. What would she do if the fires died out before she reached them? First she had to find a way through the pine forest that lay between the town and the scaffold. Once before... When she had first arrived in Trondheim, she had lost her way and stumbled upon that awful place. She had turned and left as fast as she was able, away from the disgusting stench and in fear of the horrors she had seen there. Now, her desperate need for warmth was making her go back, just stretching her icy hands towards the flames, turning her back to the fire, feeling the heat through her clothes, warming her body that had known only cold for so many days and nights. It would be a dream come true the forest. She stopped at its edge, just beyond the reach of the trees. All her life she had been afraid of the forest, just like so many people who lived in open farmland. It held too many secrets in its shadows. The girl was becoming too heavy for her tired arms, and she put her down. Can you walk by yourself, she asked. I'll carry you again in a little while. The child didn't answer, but quietly sobbing to herself, did as she was asked. The shadows were very dark between the trunks of the trees. 
Celia's eyes had grown accustomed to the night, but she still could not see what lay within. She felt she could see furtive beams with burning eyes hidden among the trees. She tried to think more clearly once again. The darkness is never completely black, she told herself. It has many shades, darker and lighter, mixing into greys. The child was frightened, too. Fear had quelled her tears, and she pressed herself tightly, ever so tightly, against Celia with a soft moan. Celia's mouth felt dry. She tried to swallow, but her fear remained. They had to keep going, step by step, and she fixed her eyes on the glow of the fires on, from the far side of the woods. It helped, but she did not dare turn around, for she could feel shapeless creatures of the unknown tugging at her heels. When they were about halfway through the trees, she felt her pulse racing, and then the blood drained from her face. She was breathless. Then, for the second time that evening, she heard a child cry. To hear that sound again was more than she could bear. Her heart was pounding madly. A babe crying in the woods. Again came the pitiful sound of an infant. It could only mean one thing. It must be a meaning. Celia was terrified at the thought. Mealing were the spirits of unwanted children, born out of wedlock and left to die without baptism. She had heard so many stories about them and always dreaded the thought that she might meet one. She knew she was in mortal danger. They would haunt anyone who passed their secret resting place. Yes, she had heard all the tales of the fate of those who passed too close to such a grave. They told of an infant child as tall as a house, screaming horribly, that followed the poor passers-by, its footsteps shaking the earth, finally clawing at their backs and dragging them into the ground. She also knew these beings could transform themselves, a black dog or a child's corpse with its own throat torn out, ravens or reptiles, each one as evil as the other. Celia was petrified. Her feet would not move, no matter how much she prayed that they would, so that she could run away from that awful place. The little girl, however, still clinging to her clothes, reacted differently. She muttered something Celia didn't understand. Just one word. A name, perhaps? It sounded like Nada or something like that. Could she have had a little brother or sister who had died recently? That was quite possible. The girl began tugging at her hand, willing her towards the cries coming from among the trees only a short distance from the path that Celia had hoped they were following. Celia held back. She desperately wanted to get away. Again, the child repeated the word, her voice choked with tears. But it's too dangerous, Celia protested. We must leave, quickly, quickly. But how could they run away? Would they have a giant mewling snapping at their heels? Oh no, that would be even worse. Suddenly a thought came to her. The souls of the dead children cried out to be baptized and yearned to be reunited with their mothers. How did one bring peace to a mewling? Did one read the sacraments for them? She was not a priest, but wait. There was an old verse, a liturgy. If only she could remember it. It was something like, I christen thee. Then she thought it better to just say every prayer she knew. Taking a deep breath, she began reciting every supplication she ever learned, Protestant mixed with Catholic, half-remembered fragments from childhood and lessons taught by the priest. Her steps uncertain, and ready to run at the slightest sign of danger, she drew near the mealing. It was quiet now. The prayers had worked. Feeling more confident, she walked a little faster while trying to think of suitable words for a rite of baptism. The girl was pulling her along, making her hurry. As they picked their way forward, Celia, in a loud but unsteady voice, said, I have found thee in the darkness of night, therefore I baptize thee, dog, if thou art a boy. Thou wast left to die, I know not when, therefore I baptize thee, live, if thou art a girl. Did that sound foolish? Would it be acceptable as a rite of baptism? Just to be sure, she added, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Although she knew full well that she had no right to utter such sacred words, only the priests were allowed to do that. Was it dangerous to call a mewling leave? Perhaps it would become mortal again and rise up with awesome might. No, better not to think of such things. She had done her best, and she could only pray that it would be enough. The girl seemed determined to find the mewling, which made Sidney even more certain that she once had a younger brother or sister. The girl would not be stopped. Celia had no choice but to follow. 
It ought to be here somewhere. Bending forward, she started to search in the deep shadows beneath the tree, her heart still pounding and her stiff and frozen fingers trembling. Should a human touch a mating? What would it feel like? Would there be anything to touch? Perhaps nothing remained there but the dry, brittle bones. Or would it be slimy and horrible? Would she suddenly find something taking hold of her wrist in a vice-like grip? She drew back her hand with an involuntary intake of breath. It was all she could do to stop herself from running away. The child must have discovered something. She was talking excitedly but incoherently, and then Celia heard a scratching sound like bits of broken wood rubbing together. Again she stretched out her hand, searching blindly in the darkness. Her fingers touched something, something round with a handle. It felt like a wooden pot with a lid. No danger there, she thought, and carried on searching. A piece of cloth, a small bundle, warmer than the frozen earth on which it lay. As she touched it, the weak cry started again. Plucking up all her courage, Celia gently felt inside the thick blanket. She touched the warm skin. It was a baby, and alive. It was not a mewling, but some poor, abandoned child left to its fate. Thank you, she whispered to the little girl. Tonight you saved the life of this baby. The girl's hands were clutching eagerly at the blanket. Nada, she said again. Celia did not have the heart to stop her, even though she was probably carrying the plague. Then she remembered the pot. She picked it up, shook it, splashing some of its contents. Celia stuck her finger into the liquid. It was not yet frozen, and tasted it. Milk. Oh, dear Lord, it was milk. For one awful moment, she held the tanker to her lips, quite ready to drain every last drop. The girl and the infant? She mustn't forget them, and she knew that if she took even the tiniest sip, she would be unable to stop. The girl first. She must have a third. She listened to the deep, delighted gulps as the child drank. It was not easy to take the drink from her, but she had no choice. The girl fought to keep it with a fury that Celia found frightening. To calm her, Celia whispered, Nada must drink too. Anyway, the milk seemed to have taken the edge off the girl's hunger already. It had not taken much to fill that small belly. She turned her thoughts to the infant. The babe was wrapped in several layers of blankets, inside which she could make out a gown that reflected a gray sheen in the dark. Celia pulled up a corner and twisted it to a point, dipped it into the milk, and put it into the infant's mouth, but it would not drink. Celia knew very little about newborn babies, did not understand that they were seldom hungry during their first day of life, nor did she know that they would not have all the strong they did not all have the strong instinct to suckle. She began to feel helpless and desperate. No matter how she tried, the infant refused the milk. Finally she gave up. They had to move on and she would not be able to carry the pot as well as the children. She only had two forearms. Feeling guilty, she drank the remaining milk, although it left a bitter taste because she knew she had taken the infant's share. She rose to her feet, cradling the infant, and took the girl by the hand. She let out a loud, uncontrollable laugh. What on earth was she doing? The blind leading the blind, she told herself. How could she possibly help these children? The milk had eased their hunger and given both Celia and the girl renewed strength. Her fear of the forest had begun to release its grip on her, and not far away she could clearly see the glow of firelight. At the edge of the woods she stopped, her eyes taking in the dreadful sight that lay before her, a huge funeral pyre spewing clouds of stinking smoke in her direction. The gallows, a black silhouette against the flames, stood surrounded by the implements of torture. Evidence of the extent of the cruelty the human mind could conceive when the opportunity to inflict pain on others presented itself. To one side stored the pillory, with a small forge nearby to provide red-hot tongs and swords when called for. There were also huge, vile-looking hooks for piercing the skin of the condemned, on which they would be left to hang. Celia knew there would be thumbscrews, vices, and many other grotesque instruments of satanic torture, and shuddered at the thought. Standing out from the rest, however, was the rack on which the bodies of unfortunate victims were broken in. Oh no, she groaned quietly. No, no. She could see men moving around the scaffold in between the contraptions. She caught sight of the executioner, his black hood covering his severed ears, and his assistant, the most despised and hated man in all of Trondheim, fussing officiously around him while the bailiff's soldiers swarmed about. 
Some of them were holding a man. He was young, with wavy blonde hair, and his hands were tied behind his back. He was being forced towards the rack. No, please don't do it, she whispered. Silhouetted by the fires, she saw he was an incredibly handsome young man. Her heart sank and her blood ran cold as she thought of the torment that he was about to endure. They stood beside the rack and the other equipment with which every bone in his body would be crushed. The executioner, headsman or hangsman, it didn't matter which he was called, walked around with the heavy determined steps, carrying a large broad-bladed axe in one hand. So the prisoner was to suffer torture before being beheaded. Celia wanted it all to stop. She had not known many young men in her life, but this one was special. Who could he be, she wondered. Was he a thief? Surely not, for there were far too many soldiers for that. He must be someone much more important. All thoughts of the young man stopped suddenly, and she jumped with fear as a deep voice from the forest behind her asked, What are you doing here, woman? Celia and the child spun around, the child letting out a shriek. Celia managed to stop herself doing the same. There, among the trees, she saw the tall shape of a man who looked part human and part animal. Then she realized he was clad in a wolfskin cloak, the shaggy hood resembling the head of an animal. Yet his shoulders were strange, broad like those of a bear. Narrow eyes gleamed at her from a face filled with drama, exquisite yet sinister, white teeth reflecting a wolf-like grin. The firelight shone on his features one moment, and the next he was in darkness. He stood motionless. Um, just wanted to warm ourselves at the fire, master, she answered, her voice trembling. Are those your children? His voice was deep and strong. Mine? Oh, no, I am but sixteen years, master, she replied with a nervous smile, rigid with cold. I found both this very night. They are foundlings. He let his eyes rest thoughtfully on her for a long time. Fearfully, Celia lowered her gaze. The little girl was also afraid and hid herself in Celia's skirts. You saved them, did you? Then he asked, Do you want to save yet one more life this night? The burning eyes made her anxious and uncertain. One more life? I don't know. I, I don't understand. Hunger and worry show on your face, he said. You can pass for someone two or three years older. Perhaps you can save my brother's life. Will you help? She wondered briefly how it was that two brothers could look so different, the handsome blonde-haired boy below and this creature with his dark, lank hair hanging over his eyes. I do not wish to see him die, she said hesitantly, but how can I save him? I cannot do it alone, he said. There are too many of them, and besides, they are looking for me. They would arrest me, and that would be of no help to him. But you... From his pocket, he took a small scroll of parchment. Here, take this message. It bears the royal seal. Tell them you are his wife, and these are his children. You live hereabouts, and his name is Neil Sterne. He is the king's messenger... And what is your name? Celia. With a look of irritation, he said, Cicely, you fo foolish girl. You can't have a peasant's name like Celia. You're a countess. Remember that. Now, you must slip this message into his clothes unnoticed and then pretend to find it. This was a daring idea, she thought. How can I pass for a countess? Nobody will believe me. Have you not looked at the child you are carrying? He snapped from among the shadows. Startled, she looked away. No, but... As the fire began to burn more brightly, it lit up the area where they stood, and she could clearly see about her. The infant was wrapped in a shawl of the finest wool, beautifully woven with shining threads of gold, the like of which Celia had never seen. The thicker blanket beneath had a brocade pattern, French lilies, she thought it was called, and finally a shining white lace and linen sheet, the one she had dipped in the milk. The man stepped forward to where they were hidden by the pines. Instinctively, she backed away. He had an aura of prehistoric, heathen timelessness about him. A mystical animal attraction mixed with an irresistible air of authority. The infant has blood on its face, he said, wiping it away with a corner of the blanket. It is a newborn. Are you sure it's not yours? Celia felt affronted. I am an honorable girl, my lord. His mouth started to smile, but then he turned his eyes towards the scaffold below. The men were not yet ready to begin their evil deeds, and a priest was still trying to persuade this brother to confess his sins. Where did you find the infant? 
in the forest, left to die. He raised his black eyebrows. Was the girl with her? No, no, I found her in the town, beside the body of her dead mother. The plague, he asked. Yes. His eyes turned to the children, and he said slowly, Truly, you have courage. I do not fear this plague. It has been my companion for many days. It strikes those around me, but I have not suffered. What could have been taken for a smile crossed his face. Neither have I, he paused. So, will you go down there? She hesitated, so he said, Having the children with you means they will keep you safe. They will not dare take a mother with her children. But wait, they must have names. Oh, um, I don't know if the babe is a boy or a girl, but I christened it Dog or Leave. I believed it was a Melian calling to me. I understand. What about the girl? She paused, thinking, and then said, They are both children of the night. I found them amidst death and darkness. I want to call her Sul, I think. Those strange eyes, like long, shining chinks in his face, fell upon her again. Your young head holds thoughts wiser than most. Will you go down there? The compliment made Celia blush, and she felt a warm glow inside. I cannot deny that I am afraid, master. You shall not go without reward. Celia shook her head. Money will not help me, but... Yes, he prompted. The needs of the children emboldened her. Looking straight at him, she said, No one will give shelter to wandering strangers in these times. These children depend on me, and I am frozen to the bone. If you could just find us food, lodging, and warmth, I shall risk my life for the young Count. The light from the fire had died down again, leaving the man's face in shadow once again. He thought for a moment. I will arrange it, he promised. Good, then I shall go. But what about my clothes? No Countess would be seen wearing these rags. I'd already thought of that, he said. Take this. From beneath the wolf skin, he pulled a cloak of deep blue velvet. While it only covered him to his waist, it easily reached to Celia's feet. She pushed her hands through the slits. There, it will hide the worst, but keep it tight about you, and take those rags off your shoes. Celia did as he said, and then asked, What about the way I speak? Yes, he said slowly. That did surprise me. Do you, not, you do not speak like a peasant. Perhaps you will sound like a countess. Just do your best. She took a deep breath. Wish me luck, master. He gave a grim nod of his head. Celia closed her eyes for a moment, took a deep, few deep breaths, and considered what she was about to do. With a firm grip on the girl's hand and cradling the infant, she started down, downwards towards the place where they were now about to bind the young man to the rack. She could sense the piercing gaze of the wolf man on her back, almost burning through her clothes. This is a very strange night, she thought. But this was just the beginning. That was chapter one of Margit Sandemol's Spellbound, book one of Legend of the Ice People.